Chapter 9, Doc Spencer. My father once told me that Doc Spencer had been looking after the people of our district for nearly 45 years. He was over 70 now and could have retired long ago. But he didn't want to retire, and his patients didn't want him to either. He was a tiny man with tiny hands and feet and a tiny round face. The face was as brown and wrinkled as a shriveled apple. He was some sort of an elf, I used to think to myself each time I saw him. A very ancient sort of an elf with a wisp, with wispy white hair and steel rim spectacles. A quick, clever little elf with a swift eye and a flashing smile and a fast way of talking. Nobody feared him. Many people loved him, and he was especially gentle with children. Which ankle? he asked. The left one, my father said. Doc Spencer knelt on the floor and took from his bag a pair of large scissors. Then, to my astonishment, he proceeded to slit the cloth of my father's left trouser leg right up to the knee. He parted the cloth and looked at the ankle, but he didn't touch it. I looked at it, too. The foot seemed to be bent around sideways, and there was a huge swelling below the ankle bone. That's a nasty one, Doc Spencer said. We'll get, we better get you into the hospital right away. May I use your phone? He called the hospital and asked for an ambulance. Then he spoke to someone else about taking x-rays and doing an operation. How's the pain? Doc Spencer asked. Would you like me to give you something? No, my father said. I'll wait till I get there. As you wish, William. But how on earth did you do it? Did you fall down the steps of that crazy caravan? Not exactly, my father said. No. The doctor waited for him to go on. So did I. As a matter of fact, he said slowly, I was mooching around up in Hazel's wood. He paused again and looked at the doctor, who was still kneeling beside him. Ah, the doctor said. Yes, I see. And what's it like up there these days? Plenty of pheasants? Stacks of them, my father said. It's a great game, Doc Spencer said, sighing a little. I only wish I was young enough to have another go at it. He looked up and saw me staring at him. You didn't know I used to do a bit of poaching myself, did you, Danny? No, I said, absolutely flabbergasted. Many a night, Doc Spencer went on, after evening surgery was over. I used to slip out the back door and go striding over the fields to one of my f secret places. Sometimes it was pheasants and other times it was trout. Plenty of big trout in the stream those days. He was still kneeling on the floor beside my father. Try not to move, he said to him. Lie quite still. My father closed his tired eyes and opened them again. Which method did you use for pheasants, he asked. Gin and raisins, Dr. Spencer said. I used to soak the raisins in gin for a week, then scatter them in the woods. It doesn't work, my father said. I know it doesn't, the doctor said, but it was enormous fun. One single pheasant, my father said, has got to eat at least 16 gin-soaked raisins before he gets tiddly enough for you to catch him. My own dad proved that with roosters. I believe you, the doctor said. That's why I never caught any, but I was hot stuff with trout. Do you know how to catch a trout, Danny, without using a rod and a line? How? I said. You tickle him. Tickle him? Yes, the doctor said. Trout, you see like to lie close into the river bank, so you go creeping along the bank until you see a big one, and you come up behind him, and you lie down on your tummy, and then slowly, very slowly, you lower your hand into the water behind him, and you slide it underneath him, and you begin to stroke his belly up and down with the tip of one finger. Will he really let you do that? I asked. He loves it, the doctor said. He loves it so much he sort of dozes off, and as soon as he dozes off, you quickly grab a hold of him and flip him out of the water onto the bank. That works, my father said, but only a great artist can do it. I take my hat off to you, sir. Thank you, William, Doc Spencer said gravely. He got up off his knees and crossed over to the door of the workshop and looked out to see if the ambulance was coming. By the way, he said over his shoulder, what happened up there in the woods? Did you step in a rabbit hole? It was a slightly bigger hole than that, my father said. What do you mean? My father began to describe how we had fallen into the enormous pit. Doc Spencer spun around and stared down at my father. I don't believe it, he cried. It's perfectly true, asked Danny. It was deep, I said, horribly deep. But great heavens alive, the little doctor shouted, jumping up and down with fury. He can't do that. Victor Hazel can't go digging tiger traps in his woods for human beings. I've never heard such a disgusting, monstrous thing in my, all my life. 
It's rotten, my father said. It's worse than that, William. It's diabolical. Do you know what this means? It means that decent folk like you and me can't even go out and have a little fun at night without risking a broken leg or arm. We might even break our necks. My father nodded. I never did like that Victor Hazel, Doc Spencer said. I saw him do a filthy thing once. What? My father asked. He had an appointment with me at my surgery. He needed an injection of some sort. I've forgotten what, anyway. Just by chance, I was looking out the window as he drove up to my door in his whacking great Rolls Royce. I saw him get out, and I also saw my old dog Bertie dozing on the doorstep. And do you know what this loathsome Victor Hazel did? Instead of stepping over old Bertie, he actually kicked him out of the way with his riding boot. He didn't, my father said. Oh, yes, he did. What did you do? I left him sitting in the waiting room while I picked out the oldest, bluntest needle I could find. Then I rubbed the point of it on a nail file to make it blunter still. By the time I'd gotten through with it, it was blunter than a ballpoint pen. Then I called him in and told him to lower his pants and bend over. And when I rammed that needle into his fleshy backside, he screamed like a stuck pig. Hooray, my father said. He's never been back since, Doc Spencer said, for which I am truly thankful. Ah, here's the ambulance. The ambulance drew up near the workshop door and two men in uniform got out. Bring me a leg splint, the doctor said. One of the men fetched a sort of thin wooden plank from the ambulance. Doc Spencer knelt down once more beside my father and eased the plank very gently underneath my father's left leg. Then he strapped the leg firmly to the plank. The ambulance men brought in a stretcher and placed it on the ground. My father got onto it by himself. I was still sitting on my chair. Doc Spencer came over to me and put a hand on my shoulder. I think you had better come on home with me, young man, he said. You can stay with us until your father's back from the hospital. Won't he be home today, I asked. Yes, my father said. I'll be back this evening. I'd rather you stayed in for the night, Doc Spencer said. I shall come home this evening, my father said. Thank you for offering to take Danny, but it won't be necessary. He'll be a all right here until I get back. I reckon he'll sleep most of the day anyway, won't you, my love? I think so, I said. Just close up the filling station and go to bed, right? Yes, but come back soon, won't you, Dad? They carried him into the ambulance on the stretcher and closed the doors. I stood outside the workshop with Doc Spencer and watched the big white thing drive out of the filling station. Do you need any help, Doc Spencer said. I'm fine, thank you. Go to bed then and get a good sleep. Yes, I will. Call me if you need anything. Yes. The marvelous little doctor got into his car and drove away down the road in the same direction as the ambulance.